afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Economy and Future of Work stage at Cognition X. I am absolutely delighted to welcome you all to a conversation between Mike Lynch and Alexandra Musavisa Day on the possibilities and pitfalls of AI. I'd also like you to, to encourage you to tweet any of your thoughts or comments following the session at, at COGX 2020. Um, and I think this is going to be a fascinating discussion on how we should look at AI going forward um, from two experts in the field. Thank you very much and handing over to Mike and Alexandra. Thank you so much. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here at COGX. Thank you so much for having, having us. And it's a, a real honor to sit on a in conversation with uh, Mike Lynch. Um, who has been so um, kind and generous with his time, um, also supporting uh, us through many conversations as we built the Global AI Index. But um, Mike, uh, you're founder of one of the most successful businesses in the UK. You are a scientist by background yourself. And um, we are very keen to spend these next 30 minutes uh, trying to, to um, understand this and get to the signal uh, in the noise of AI uh, as there's a lot of hype around this and really sort of cut to, to what, is the, what is the reality on the ground and where are we on the spectrum of, of developing AI. Um, there are many questions that we're going to try and get to in these 30 minutes. But I just wanted to, to start out with saying that, you know, having you know, worked in this field from the time of um, uh, your time at Cambridge University in the 80s, if you could, broadly speaking, tell us a little bit about the developments that have occurred within this field during this time. Also, how do you rate some of the commentary that we're seeing in this area today? Um, and what, are the, what sort of things are people not quite getting in relation to AI? So if you could sort of, um, sort of start us out with, with, with cutting through the, through the noise and getting really to the core of, of what this is. Yeah, obviously, these days we hear AI all over the place. You know, you can't pick up a newspaper without reading an article and every company pitch has AI in it. Um, having worked in the, the field since the 80s, you've seen an incredible explosion of what's going on. And the question is, what, what do we actually mean by AI? And, and by this, I don't mean the, the sort of academic definitions, but if we're going to have a debate about this new thing called AI, well, what is it about? And uh, that, I think, is the first thing to understand what the, the essence of the new age is and the power in this. Um, when I first started, AI was used to refer to what were called expert systems, you know, and these are, are sort of very elaborate ways, and these are generalizations, but of, of saying, you know, if this and that, then the other. So they were sort of very scripted things. And then in the 80s, there was a breakthrough in machine learning things like Bayesian inference, where the approach was turned around to one where it learned from the real world. And uh, that became very useful and powerful. There was a, a method called neural networks that didn't quite work back then. And then uh, what we've seen is let's move forward. Um, really, around 2000, we started to see neural network come into a form that was much more practically useful. And, and we saw the development of deep learning. And then we saw some amazing things happen. We saw these new AI methods outperform any of the older approaches for things like speech. And then around 2010, image recognition. And now we see things like generative adversarial networks painting pictures by masters. And we see um, recurrent networks and doing things like natural language. So we're now in a situation where there are problems that can be solved that could not be solved before. And that, to me, is the is the big difference. So if we're just taking normal signal processing or um, data analytics that's been around a long time and labeling that for marketing AI, that's not really informing us about uh, what's changed and where the, the new power has come. And it's in these kind of data driven, subtle, complex problems that we can now solve that we could, couldn't solve before. And that's opened up all the possibilities now. The problem with that is as soon as you see that amazing leap, people then assume that intelligence is some sort of continuum. And because we've managed to, for example, solve something very difficult like image recognition or, or you know, text generation type problems, then we've got the ability to produce sort of super intelligences and things like this. And of course, the big difference here is the difference between 
narrow AI, which is something which has got a very defined problem, even if it's a very difficult one it's dealing with, and a broad AI, which is something that could make its way in the real world in, in general, um, you know, in the way that an animal does or something like that. So the first thing to understand is we're nowhere near broad AI at the moment, as far as we can tell. Um, and we're in a situation where what's interesting in AI are these difficult problems that can now be solved by systems that solve them. So that's led to a lot of interest from a lot of people. And the difficulty I think the subject suffers from is that we all think we know how we make decisions. So every one of us makes decisions every day. Um, we've gone to school, we had to explain to the teacher why we thought something. And so we take that knowledge and one of the things we may well come on to is I'm not sure we do know how we make decisions ourselves, but certainly that <laughs> doesn't copy across to how these AI systems work. And because of that, I think we're starting to see a lot of noise in the commentary and also in some of the uses of AI, um, which actually are, are leading us in the wrong direction. It could have significant impact for things like government policy. Thank you. Um, and I and I guess, you know, just to stay on, I mean, we want to really want to get to government policy in a bit, but 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 looking at some of the some of the issues that get raised a lot is is a question of bias and the bias and the data. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your views on that. I mean, as you have pointed out previously, this is just the data reflects us as humans. And but is you know, what role does AI play in fixing some of those issues, do you think? Well, first of all, AI is a force for good and evil in these things, and sometimes it feels like you're only hearing the, the, the evil side. But the first thing to understand really is, is what, how does bias arise in AI? And what we're seeing is a lot of commentary, which is understandably and good for reason, for good reason and motive, but is losing sight of how these systems actually work. So, for example, if we were talking about, um, I've had commentators that I've been in discussions with and it's become very clear that they don't understand that these systems learn from data. So they assume that someone has written, and they'll often use the phrase algorithm, when what they mean is a computer program. So again, coming back to the if then else. And obviously, if someone who is writing a program that tells a computer, if, if the person has this, do that, then that may well reflect very directly uh, and often intentionally their own biases. The important thing to understand is that that is not how these clever AI systems work. Um, they are learning from data. And, um, and you know, it, it's amazing to see some of the most vocal commentators when I've spoken to them haven't really understood the difference in those two things. Then I think you have another level of bias in, in the world where without meaning to, researchers um, reinforce their own bias. A very famous example is when we would developing image compression back in the 80s. It was mainly males, because it was engineering, and it was mainly young ones. And so they had a standard picture they would test everything on, which was a, a lady in a hat called Lena, um, who was a white lady of interest to young researchers, but was not a very representative data set. And so the danger was that you got an inherent bias there. Well, again, that's less likely in AI. In, in modern AI, what you're doing is you've got two inputs which are where the problems can come. One is the data set. Um, and then the other is, is rather like a sort of genie in a Disney story is what you ask it to do. So to give you some examples of this, you know, an, an AI, if we've got a very nice example at the moment where there's been a, a big upgrade in um, an AI for dealing with text. And so the thing has had to look at trillions, literally of words of text from humanity. And, um, is gonna come out with some of the typical stereotypes that you would see in some of the biases around gender and race because it's reading everything that we write and that is inherent. And that's actually a very difficult problem to solve because if you've got trillions of words, how do you go in and tell the AI data not to include those things? Um, but that is a, you know, a fundamental thing that we might want to change. Another example is in the goal. If we, for example, train an AI by, I don't know, taking in job CVs and we want it to predict whether that person would have been hired, then an easy way to do that is give them the CVs historically and then who was hired. But of course, the AI is just going to learn any bias in the current people doing the hiring. 
So we might get one stage better there, for example, by rather than looking at who the humans hired, look at, I don't know, who made the best sales commissions, because that's an actual test of the skill set that we're trying to get the AI to do. So the important thing here is the, the goal function is very important. But there is also another very important aspect to, to bias, which is it has to be inherent in the problem sometimes. You don't get anything for free. If, if a, one of these systems is working well, it will be using all of its ability to solve the problem. So let me give you a sort of example. If we're trying to, I don't know, recognize people on a London street, then it's very rare that someone from Ruritania walks down that street. And so if we were to use real London street footage, the performance of that system for Ruritanians would be very low. Now, the question is, does that matter for what we're doing? Because the thing that sometimes gets forgotten is if we then took a whole load of Ruritanian images and put them in, well, the performance for the rest of the Londoners, who are the ones that are actually there, would fall. They would not be as accurate. So you don't get something for nothing. What you have to do is say, what am I doing? And often the correct answer is you want data that which is as representative of the real problem um, as you can get. So you don't want a situation where you've tried to overclean the data and therefore it won't work on a London street. So there are different levels of dealing with bias and it, it, it's actually quite a complex issue. But of course, the fundamental one is what do we want the genie to do? What do we actually do? We want it to be as accurate as possible, even if that means that there are subsets for which it's less accurate or do we want equal um, accuracy? Then, of course, the other side of it is just saying we mustn't lose sight of the fact that AIs are objective once they're trained. So, you know, if you're replacing a human who might uh, well have inherent biases, actually the AI can be a big step forward. And also in other areas, so for example, the Tubman project in America, where AI is being used to help public defenders give defense to people who normally wouldn't get a great defense because the public defender is overstretched. So these things can be used for both good causes and bad causes, but it's getting that understanding of what you're actually doing here. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Mike, for clarifying that. I mean, I guess, I guess that sort of segues nicely to uh, one of the other really big topics that we've got, we want to cover in, in these 30 minutes, which is about um, the sort of the ethical discussions around um, around AI and 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 if you could talk to us a bit about what you you know what you think you know where we are on that spectrum what kind of guardrail should be should be put in now obviously it's uh, the development of AI and and uh, the deployment of it it is happening very quickly um, and uh, governments and policymakers are trying to follow suit with 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 working out what are the right responses from a sort of ethical regulatory uh, perspective, but what what are your what are your views on 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 where that is now and and what the what the right response should be on the ethics side? Well, I think there's a, a real danger here of again people um, thinking they understand the problem and therefore mm -hmm. generating policy. And perhaps the, the most interesting example of this is one where you see lots of people doing research, which is explainability. So the AI has made a decision and you're getting a, a sort of policy, a concept that uh, that has to be explainable for it to be valid. And the big difficulty with this is it doesn't understand the nature of these problems. So for something to be explainable, what that actually means to most people is that I can use normal human language to explain it. So... I decided A because I saw B and C in the light of D. And the difficulty with human language is that it's very good at very definite relationships where there's a very limited number of variables. So if I was explaining to you why something has happened, I'm probably not going to mention more than five or six factors, and I'm going to give you very strong relationships. Well, the real power of AI comes from the fact that it works much more like our subconscious mind in that it can take into account very large numbers of very subtle variables. And you can do some beautiful experiments that show that when people tell you why they made a decision, what they've actually done is retrofitted an argument to something which is far more fundamental. And so the difficulty here is that 
if you tried to make the AI be expressible in these very simple terms of explainability, the performance, if the AI was actually doing that, falls massively. So you then get into this interesting question of how many autonomous vehicle accidents am I prepared to allow so that the car can tell me why it crashed? Um, and again, people haven't really understood the idea that explainability is of itself a constraint. And actually, fundamentally, um, we all make decisions. When we drive down a country road, the speed at which we take a corner is actually a very subtle distillation of many different things that we've noticed about what's going on around us. Uh, and that's what we use to make the decision, not the simple explanation we'll give. So if this doesn't start to be more sophisticated in its understanding by policymakers, we're in danger of really nobbling um, the, the sector because you're actually just back to the expert systems of the 1980s if you want them to be, if then else, explainable. Now, there are some interesting approaches to trying to do this, but fundamentally, we have to understand that how decisions in the real world get made are more complicated than how we tell each of us. And you can kind of see this. We wouldn't have the subject of politics if every time we had a set of data, um, we explained why the right decision was made. Um, then, you know, rather like the Borg in Star Trek, we'd all just agree. <laughs> but because actually the reality is, no matter what you say, um, you're building in your experience and many other subtle factors. And, it, you know, you see it in all parts of human life. If you take a courtroom, you know, there'll be a pretty formal statement of rules, which is the law. But actually, most lawyers would want to have a witness in the witness box so that the jury can actually read all sorts of subtle things. Um, which they take into account subconsciously in reaching their decision. So explainable decisions often will get you the wrong answer is the quite surprising conclusion when you look at it mathematically. But then if you take um, to your point on, on, on how this, you know, for policymakers and for, what is it that they need to, do they need to let go of needing this to be fully transparent and explainable? And uh, so, so how do you see the role of policymakers in, in that question of explainability as in, do, do they just let, let that be? And then I think I'd like to come back to the role of government, but if you could maybe just, um, just address that question of, of the explainability and the, and the policymaking. Yeah, so for these type of problems, you have to accept that you're never going to get every single case right. And that's a big, shocking thing. But the reason you slip over when you walk across the floor is most of the time you take into account all the variables and you get the right decision and you make it to the other side of the room. But very occasionally, um, you will fall over. And of course, the art in producing a good system is one which is right as much as possible, given the data that's possible. And so the big step forward, and I don't think it's just policymakers, it's almost something which we as humans at this point in our history have to understand is uncertainty. What we need to realize is that we're not going to get every answer right when we're looking at these very complex problems, but what we want is the best decision making we can make. And this idea of ensemble uncertainty is one which, if you haven't come up through the sciences, is quite alien um, to you. So, for example, um, you know, every day I make decisions. I don't get all of them right, but that doesn't mean that I'm useless. It actually means that I'm very good. I can deal with very complex situations. And so we have to get to an understanding that these very difficult problems, whether they're done by humans or they're done by machines, have an error rate. And actually, that's a good thing. We have to embrace uncertainty mm -hmm. as well. An interesting example might be, the way in which we use language about a right decision. So, for example, if I said I've got a box A has got 90% um, of having a million pounds in it, chance, and box B has got 10% of having a million pounds in it, what's the right decision? Which box to choose? Well, it's box A. But if I open it and it turned out to be box B, we would say you made the wrong decision. Well, you made the wrong decision when you've got more information. That's not the same as whether you made the right decision at the time with the information you had. And so even our language 
is all geared to this idea that there's an absolute answer which we're just trying to discover. Whereas actually in the modern world for these complex systems and our complex financial systems and things like this, it's this embracing of uncertainty. Um, and it's going to do a lot of work because we've had a long time using language that we use for things like explainability and uh, these sort of things. That understanding uncertainty is crucial to make things that are useful. But I, I think too, I think, and also we have spoken about before, there's a sort of, there has to be a certain appetite um, for an error rate, right? So um, different countries will have a different level of appetite to test things that have impact on human life. And, and I, 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 you know, so that has to be, uh, you know, that's part of the decision making of when, when and how you roll out and when you feel it's safe. But as it's you say, there's always going to be... Alexandra, because actually one of the tests is, is it safer than the human who's currently doing the job? And so one of the great um, sort of illusions is that the humans are right and the machine's wrong. And I learned this actually years ago in that I did a test with an AI for classifying news articles and it was scored against an editor and it got 97%. And the, um, the editor came back and said, well, it's very good, but it's 3% wrong. And then I pretty quickly learned that what you needed to do was get three or four other editors and they all disagreed by 3%. And so in that situation, the machine is as accurate as person. Mm -hmm. um, if I've got a car driver and, um, and I've got an autonomous vehicle and the autonomous vehicle is safer, even if the autonomous vehicle has accidents, it's still a step forward. But the assumption that the human is always right um, is actually going to hold you back from a policy point of view. Yeah, but and we've seen we've seen how that uh, gets commented in the news when when a when a vehicle has an accident. But I just wanted before we don't have a lot of time, and I wanted to to bring us into the question of the role of government. Um, it is something we have have touched on on before in terms of uh, what what role does government need to play in creating the right ecosystem for um, the innovation side of AI and the deployment side of AI. And I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts about, uh, you know, what role should government play in facilitating this? Um, this is a time where a lot of uh, countries are um, publishing um, AI strategies and, and really trying to, to, to get it right in terms of facilitating an investment environment that's conducive and the right talent pool and you've got the right research and and the, all of the enabling factors around it. So if we take it as a given that this is a good thing that we, that we are advancing because it's going to uh, uh, facilitate a step change in growth going forward, um, what, are the, what are the ways in which the governments can help? Um, and where well, do you see them coming in to support? We could spend another 30 minutes on that. Um, but to give you three things to think about, data is a rocket fuel of this area. It's what powers. So... Um, making the right kind of data available is incredibly powerful. And then the only reason you look up and can see an airplane in the sky is that uh, in the past, governments came up with legal and therefore insurance frameworks, which meant that even though this was a new technology, um, it could be adopted before legal precedent and set down. And that's going to be what it takes. So you're going to have to see frameworks where we understand that autonomous vehicles crash um, but as long as they don't crash more than the humans, then it shouldn't be treated very differently. So those are some of the key enablers. And then obviously we have the fundamental one, which is education. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there is a new set of skills here. Uh, we need to see a workforce that can adapt to some of those new skills and, um, uh, and make the transition that you know, these kind of technologies are going to take us through in society. Right. And um, finally, perhaps... Um, I mean, of course, you know, we're, we're talking about AI here in this in this session and trying to really sort of hone in on 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 what the, what the reality of of this is. But but I think you know you've you've spoken earlier about how AI also is going to play a role in 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 the recovery. And I'm wondering if you could just um, talk to us a bit about how how you see this, I've, you know, you've, you've mentioned before that, that um, you're, you know, we're seeing obviously a lot of the trends are wound away, that they're accelerating. 
and uh, as as uh, looking at how businesses are going to survive through something that's a quite an extreme crisis that they're facing, cost cutting is 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 very important. It's very hard to make predictions, as you've always said, Mike. Um, so hedging is the best way to go forward, right? So I'm wondering if you could just talk to us a bit about you know predictions are hard, especially now we're seeing these trends. Um, we have a sense of what AI can and cannot do. So what, 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 what role do you see it play going forward and sort of bringing us out of, out of the crisis or sort of through the recovery? Well, I think from a, a point of view, one of the effects that we're seeing with this, this crisis is that things that were dying slowly have died quickly. And mm -hmm. you know, we're seeing business models that were probably on their way out disappear. That means that there is going to be opportunity um, and the cost base of that opportunity is key. So getting AIs that can automate tasks um, is going to give a margin advantage. I think other areas where you can see value add moving beyond what was traditionally done. So for example, I think the legal profession is very interesting. You know, what generally happens after a situation like this is that there's a lot of litigation and um, a lot of things happen in the legal world. Well, moving to the next level where you're using the um, human input to add real creativity and the AI is doing a lot of the grunt work. I think that's a model we're going to see in, in lots of other industries where they're going to be forced to move up a level in terms of value add. And the humans do that. So this is you know the area that's often called augmented intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that you, you sort of pass off a lot of the, the bulk, lower value work. I think there's going to be a time of um, opportunity because of the acceleration of the demise of some of the old business models. Uh, and then people are open to new things. You know, just as we've seen video conferencing, we're seeing people, for example, automatically note taking now using AI off of these meetings, and things like that, and the analysis of things there. So there, there is a, an opportunity coming. In terms of the practical day-to-day -day thing, obviously it's incredibly difficult to be an individual business out there. And uh, you know, it is important to realize that things like the funding environment uh, are gonna become much harsher. So you really have to show a benefit. You have to be able to point very clearly to, if you're saying you're doing AI, what is it you can do that no one else can do? And you know, pre the crisis, probably 80 to 90% of what came through my door as being AI had very little AI in it. It was just mm -hmm. data in a traditional way. Those businesses are not going to be fundable now. Um, if you're using the AI card, you've got to really show this is something that can be done that wasn't done before. The good news is, I think if you can do that, um, the status quo has been disrupted enough that people are prepared to try new ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Normally in, industri in industries, there's a lot of momentum and you don't see things getting changed. People have spent days thinking about how everything is different now. Now, some of that will go back to normal, but they're at least open to a very new way of doing things. So it's a time of great stress, but it is a time of opportunity. And um, I don't think things are going to go back the way they were. You know, where an AI can automate a mundane task it will now be used to do that just in that we have about a minute and a half left i just i just wanted it in sort of closing remarks mike i mean going back to sort of looking sort of now through this um disruptive time but through the lens of ai i mean what are the things that you're going to what do you think will emerge from this if you're going to you know pick some areas where you th you think are going to do particularly well um uh you, they're using using ai as a base so what would be those areas that you would you would say are probably going to um see um come out strengthened or or will be will be areas to watch in the next five years i think you've got two distinct groups you've got the you know the at the end of the day an ai fundamentally is doing something which normally um a human could do if they were infinitely quick um, at doing something. It's very rare to find an AI doing something better than a human. The first category is things that cannot be done by the human. So a nice example of this is cybersecurity. It's just far too fast. It happens, attacks happen far too quickly. They're far too subtle. Um, and so that's going to be an area where you're going to see a lot of AI as an example of those kind of problems that can't be done 
any other way. You know, I'd be very interested in seeing, for example, things like traffic problems, mm -hmm. having an all seeing AI actually thinking about a city as a system and things like that. And then you have the other category, which is perhaps not as exciting, but probably far more economically important, which is a lot of people have been employed to do relatively mundane tasks. Um, and there are whole professions that have been built on people doing things. So we mentioned the legal profession, you know, even things like, I don't know, looking for fraud in, in bank card transactions, this sort of stuff. The ability to, um, to take the vast flow of information that's coming through and then surface what the human really needs to do. So this idea of augmented intelligence, mm -hmm. that is what is going to have uh, probably the biggest impact. And that is going to change many professions. I think the lawyers are finally falling. I think when it comes to things like diagnosis and uh, areas like that, we're even seeing the medical profession, which is also another very conservative um, profession starting to fall there. If you're talking about something like, you know, contract processing or invoicing and things like that, which, you know, at the moment, a lot of human work is done in those tasks. I think you're going to see those um, become automated very quickly. And then what you'll have is people wanting to show that they're adding much higher value than that. And that's why we're going to have to have an adaptable workforce to right. tasks that show value. Right. Fascinating. Mike, we could continue uh, for another half hour or more, but unfortunately we have reached the end of the session. It's now one o'clock and we're going to have to close. But um, a huge round of applause from everyone listening to you for thanking, thanking you so much for giving us your, um, yes, your views on, on the sort of the, the reality of AI as it stands today. Um, a very interesting. And thank you so much, Mike, for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.